Caitlin. I love your guitar. <laughs> so good. I'm so used to playing small ones that go into a big one. I'm like, this is a different level. And it's still so I'm, wear I'm wearing it. <laughs>
my stomach quick. <laughs> Hey? Good morning, everyone. Hear the call to worship from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Let's come and do that now. Yeah. 
have a God who it is said that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. So please join with me as we read this confession. Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. And hear the assurance of pardon. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 3. It's Genesis chapter 3 and we'll be reading the whole chapter. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and was also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. 
He will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flashing, and a flashing sword and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Right, this is the time of our service where the kids uh, get to gather in the back and head out to their programs. Um, if you have creche age children, that's up to kindy. Um, we would ask that you go with them to creche, which is all the way at the back. You can just follow the crowd as they head out. Um, yeah, and our kids' program is for those in pre-primary through to year six. Um, as a general note to parents, um, we do ask that you sign in your children either before the service or now if you would go with them if you haven't already signed them in. And then you'll sign them out at the end of the service as well. And with that, we're going to stand and sing our next song.
was strong enough to come and fight for me, to go through hell and down into the grave, and raise me up to see you face to face, to raise me up to see you face to face. Oh, my God, my God, my God, has heaven opened up, pouring out of us, who plays the game, who came to the world, in his love, like my God. Oh, my God, my God, my God, has heaven God has so loved us. And one of the ways that we show gratitude is also through the regular giving to his work. Um, all the details for that are in our um, order of service there, um, as well as the words from 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, please join me now as I pray for the leaders here at Vic Park and also at Bull Creek. Dear Heavenly Father, we come and we thank you for the team of leaders which you have given us here at Vic Park. We thank you that Norton, Bryce, Roy and Marco have been able to pass their eldership exam. Lord, we do pray for the whole leadership team, that you will sustain them as they seek to serve this congregation. Help them not only to serve us and lead us, but also to lead their own family as well. Lord, we also want to lift up the leaders at our mother church, Bull Creek. Lord, we do pray for their elders and deacons of both the English and Indonesian congregations. Pray that you'll continue to strengthen them. Guide them through the difficulties of ministry, but keep their eyes firmly on Jesus, his grace and his gospel, as they serve and lead your church. Please continue to raise up leaders also in each generation who will hold firmly to your word, who will lead and guide your church. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steph. I'm the Women's Discipleship Leader here, and I'm just doing the one announcement today. Um, it's about something called the Perth Women's Convention. Can I just get a show of hands who's been there before? Yeah, so quite a few people. If you've never been before, maybe grab one of the people that have been and just get a little rundown of what happens. Basically, it's run by an organisation called CCOWA, and um, they seek to organise events uh, that are interdenominational, that preach Christ across Perth, to give an opportunity for people to sort of interact and encourage one another in the gospel. And this year, because of a multitude of reasons, um, we're not going to be meeting all together as women. So what's going to happen is there's going to be individual hubs all around Perth. And our church gets to host one. It's so great. Um, it's going to be in the theatrette. And because we're hosting, we'll need to have a few volunteers get around the event and help it run. Um, so it's going to be on the 22nd of October, which is still ages away. But I'm hoping you'll be able to put that in your diary. It will be from about 9 to 1. And if you would like to get involved and um, be part of the people that run it, if you can come and let me know by the end of August, that would be great. My email is at the bottom of the handout that you get. Um, so if you, you can flip me an email or grab me in person, I don't mind. But yeah, if you could let me know if you'd like to be involved with helping run it by the end of August and also put 22nd of October in your diary. And there is a men's event, but because I'm not a man, I'm not going to tell you about it. <laughs> 
Actually, I think it's the last weekend of August on the Saturday. Maybe grab yarn or bice or one of those blokes and they will tell you more about it. Thanks, Steph. I'm actually making a sneaky uh, couple of other announcements. Good morning, church. I'm Matt. If you don't know me, I'm the pastor here. Just two quick things. Uh, so one, this is, I think, the second last Sunday to sign up for camp. Um, if you would like any more information about camp, as you walked in on your left, there is a poster with a QR code. You can scan that, and then that will take you to the registration page that will give you more information. Uh, and the camp's coming up on the 9th to the 11th of September. We've plugged it a lot. I won't, I won't plug it again, but I will give it one big push uh, next Sunday um, because regos are closing. Uh, the, the other announcement is more kind of like a uh, celebratory um, praise the Lord moment. Uh, so we did vote after the service uh, for our potential uh, four ruling elders, and the uh, votes were um, overwhelmingly positive. So the men got a minimum of like 90% approval rating, if not more, which I know all the politicians in the room, or any politician out there would be very happy with a 90%. Uh, so I thought uh, it would be a wonderful... Um, way for us to show our gratitude to God for raising up these men and for our encouragement to do a very unpresbyterian thing and clap right now. Yeah. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll give more information in the coming weeks about what it might look for those men as they become um, kind of officially elders here. There's a few more steps to go, but I thought I'd give you that heads up uh, right now. Uh, l- well, let's stand and sing our next song, uh, "Come You Thirsty."
Hi everyone, I'm Beck, and I'll be praying and then reading our second reading from Exodus 26. So we'll be reading the whole of the chapter, Exodus 26, but before we do that, please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your loving care for us and for giving us many good gifts, most of all your Son, Jesus, who came to dwell with us and be a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for the gift of your word in the Bible. Please be with Matt this morning and help him teach your word faithfully. And through the work of your spirit, please open our hearts and minds to your word. Through this, help us to follow and glorify you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Exodus chapter 26. Make the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple and scarlet yarn, with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. All the curtains are to be the same size. 28 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together and do the same with the other five. Make loops of blue material along the edge of the curtain in one set and do the same with the end in the other set. Make 50 loops on one curtain and 50 loops on the end curtain of the other set with the loops opposite each other. Then make 50 gold clasps and use them to fasten the curtains together so that the tabernacle is a unit. Make curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle, 11 altogether. All 11 curtains are to be the same size, 30 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together into one set and the other six into another set. Fold the sixth curtain double at the front of the tent. Make 50 loops along the edge of the end curtain in one set and also along the edge of the end curtain in the other set. Then make 50 bronze clasps and put them in the loops to fasten the tent together as a unit. As for the additional length of the tent curtains, the half curtain that is left over is to hang down at the rear of the tabernacle. The tent curtains will be a cubit longer on both sides What is left will hang over the sides of the tabernacle so as to cover it. Make for the tent a covering of ram skins dyed red and over that a covering of other durable leather. Make upright frames of acacia wood for the tabernacle. Each frame is to be 10 cubits long and a cubit and a half wide with two projections set parallel to each other. Make all the frames of the tabernacle in this way. Make 20 frames for the south side of the tabernacle and make 40 silver bases to go under them. Two bases for each frame, one under each projection. For the other side, the north side of the tabernacle, make 20 frames and 40 silver bases, two under each frame. Make six frames for the far end, that is the west end of the tabernacle, and make two frames for the corners at the far end. At these two corners, they must be double from the bottom all the way to the top and fitted into a single ring. Both shall be like that. So there will be eight frames and 16 silver bases, two under each frame. Also make crossbars of acacia wood, five for the frames on one side of the tabernacle, five for those on the other side, and five for the frames on the west, at the far end of the tabernacle. The centre crossbar is to extend from end to end at the middle of the frames. Overlay the frames with gold and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. Also overlay the crossbars with gold. Set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown you on the mountain. Make a curtain of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen with cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps and place the Ark of the Covenant Law behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. 
put the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant Law in the most holy place. Place the table outside the curtain on the north side of the tabernacle and put the lampstand opposite it on the south side. For the entrance to the tent, make a curtain of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer. Make gold hooks for this curtain and five posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and cast five bronze bases for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, uh, Beck, for that. Well, uh, good morning. As I said earlier, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm the pastor here at Vic Park Presbyterian, uh, and it's my uh, great pleasure and joy to deliver to you this morning our introduction to our introduction to the book of Leviticus. That is to say that this is not the introduction sermon. That's happening in a couple of weeks' time. We've got a bunch of baptisms next week. That's why we're kind of skipping a week. This is our intro to the intro to Leviticus. And can I say no one's paying me to say this? This is probably, I don't know, the 15th, 20th uh, series I've preached uh, in the Bible over my seven, eight years of pastoral ministry. And I think this is probably the one that I'm most excited about across my years, which might shock you if you know the book of Leviticus. I'll get to why in a moment. Uh, I want to begin by talking about the Skeleton Coast. Hands up if you've ever heard of the Skeleton Coast. A few of us. Uh, it's, a, it's along Namibia uh, in the west of Africa, kind of southwest of Africa. It's the coastline or that, that stretches the majority of Namibia's, um, uh, the, the country, and it's probably, it's debated, but it's probably the most hostile stretch of coastline in the world. It's a sandy and desolate area of almost 6,500 square miles, 10,000 square kilometres, where the desert quite literally runs into the sea. And if the lack of water, because there's an incredible dearth, lack of fresh water, because it's a desert, if the lack of water on the shore won't kill you, then the waters offshore will. These waters are famous for their strong currents, their dense fogs, their treacherous sandbanks that are constantly moving. These extreme climactic and geographical conditions when combined with strong sandstorms, is the cause of over a 1,000 shipwrecks over the last 500 years. A 1,000 shipwrecks. And it's these wrecks, together with the skeletons of large sea-going mammals, so think whales, the wrecks and the carcasses dot the shore of this land, hence Skeleton Coast. And even though Skeleton Coast, I think you'll agree, is a cool name, it's not the coolest name that the stretch of coast has. The second coolest name is what the Portuguese navigators called it centuries ago, which is the Beach of Hell. But that's not number one. Number one is what the native bushmen of of Namibia call it to this day. And its name is this. It's the land that God created in anger. The land that God created in anger. That's sick, isn't it? It's just really cool. Uh, why am I starting with the Skeleton Coast, aside from it being an uh, interest of mine? I start there because for many, Leviticus is the skeleton coast of the Scriptures, of the Bible. Littered with thousands of carcasses of animals slain, frightening with its threats of death and judgment, a picture of a tempestuous God, but also like the skeleton coast, dry. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 1. It's the third book of the Bible, so it's just after that reading that that Beck did so well with. Uh, Leviticus 1, and I'm going to read from verse 3 and onwards. Most of us preachers, when we're... um, 
writing our sermons, as you would have seen that I've just done now, is you kind of think of a way to um, entice and attract the audience. Not so with God and Moses here. Chapter 1, right at the start, verse 3. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be acceptable on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priests, will bring blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance of the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron the priest are to put it on the fire and arrange wood on the altar. Then Aaron's sons, the priest, will arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, you would offer a male without defect. You would have slaughtered on the north side of the altar before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priest, will splash its blood against the sides of the altar. You would have cut it into pieces, and the priest shall arrange them, including the head and the fat on the wood that is burning on the altar. You would have washed the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to bring them all and burn them on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Control C, control V, control C, control V, control C, control V for what feels like 24 chapters. It feels dry, almost like reading a recipe book, but worse because it's filled with recipes that you're never going to cook. An instruction manual for a piece of furniture that you're never going to build and sit on. And think about it after all, it's instructions that God gave three and a half thousand years ago to priests, the Levites, hence Leviticus, but to a, a, a tribe of priests that doesn't exist, instructions about sacrifices that no one, as far as I'm aware, still does, located in a place, the tabernacle, that no longer exists, all to fulfill a purpose that we'll soon realise no longer needs to be fulfilled. Dry and pointless. Not only that, but like the skeleton coast itself, it is shipwrecked many a Bible-in-a-year reading plan. Preach, right? Yeah, you know it. Your experience, if you've come to the Bible for the first time, is you read Genesis and you are loving it. Creation, flood, Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, action-packed. I mean, weird, dysfunctional family towards the end, but then redeemed by Joseph, who's this good guy that does amazing things in Egypt. And then Exodus. Oh, what an incredible start. You're kidding me? Plague of frogs, darkness, angel of death. Look, to be fair, it nosedives in 21 and you've got to read chapters like the one Beck read and then at 40 it's gone, oh my gosh, how much about this tabernacle? It's limping. It's still kind of four out of five. Leviticus, though, non-starter, train wreck, dumpster fire, waste of your time, waste of God's time and Moses' time for writing it and mine for reading it. I exaggerate, but I suspect only a little bit, right? Okay, I'm happy to be proved wrong here. Hands up if you in a church, and this can kind of be an indictment on the own church that many of us come from, hands up if you've been through a Leviticus series in church in the last decade. Oh, Melita, well done. Go to her church. Well, that's probably in Brisbane, so that's too far away. Yeah. We kind of avoid it, don't we? And let me, let me add myself to the list of people that have heretofore, up until now, not been exactly smitten with Leviticus. I'm someone whose Bible reading plan has many a time died in those pages. So here's what I propose. I'm going to give you, I'm going to do two things this morning. First thing is, I'm going to give you four reasons why I think studying Leviticus, aside from the fact we feel like we should because it's in the Bible, four reasons, four arguments, I'm not going to prove them today, I'm going to make them, and then over the next 10 weeks, I hope I'm going to prove them, of why studying Leviticus is critical for the life of a 21st century perfite Christian, or any Christian at any era. So here's my four reasons for why we should study Leviticus. Reason number one, if you don't know Leviticus, you won't properly understand the rest of the Old Testament, which is the first two-thirds of the Bible before Jesus, but you also won't really deeply understand the rest of the, the Bible that is the New Testament after Jesus has come. Let, let me sharpen that a little bit. Let me be a little more polemical. Without Leviticus, your understanding of the Old and New Testament will have gaping holes, and with it, I would say, 
your understanding will almost exponentially be improved. So one, because we don't understand our Bible without it. Number two, without the book of Leviticus, it's extremely unlikely that you, that I, that we will either grasp the depth of our sin and our depravity, or on the flip side, the molten, magnificent, magnitudinous glory of God. Or to put it kind of in a less wordy way, without Leviticus, you won't understand yourself and you won't understand God, the Creator, properly. Number three, without Leviticus, your understanding of Jesus' death will be likely rather thin and monodimensional. It quite possibly will amount to nothing more than Jesus died for my sin. But there is so, so much more going on in Jesus' death that Leviticus gives us the key to unlocking. His sacrifice isn't simply about dying as a substitute. It is that. Don't mishear me. It's never less than that. But there's so, so much more going on in his death. And number four, without Leviticus, I contend that you probably won't understand the importance of the resurrection and Jesus' ascension, that's him going up after his resurrection to sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That is, you'll probably get that Jesus had to die to rise from the dead, to beat death, to prove he's innocent or God or something like that. But you probably won't understand why he had to ascend to the Father, and you probably won't understand what he's doing right now without Leviticus. Okay. In a nutshell, four points again. Won't understand the Bible properly. Two, won't understand yourself or God properly. Three, won't understand the crucifixion properly. Four, you won't understand the resurrection fully. Again, not proving any of that today. My hope is over the 10 weeks that will be proved. Uh, here's where I'm, this is the second part of this morning's sermon. Uh, Leviticus is more, though, it's more than just teaching you stuff that's good, in fact, critical to know. Because the book of Leviticus is mainly about stuff that was performed and done. That is, the book contains, as you read it, all the instructions that the priests of Israel had to carry out. Ceremonies and rites they performed for nearly 1,500 years. And critically this, rituals that if they did not perform, instructions that they did not obey to the letter then Israel, and millennia later, you and me would be eternally ruined. Let me repeat that, because that's a hard gear change right there. Let me say that again. Without Leviticus, without its laws for priests, for sacrifices, for washing, for distinguishing between clean and unclean, profane and holy... All those categories that kind of seem a bit obscure and kind of irrelevant to us, without that, Israel, God's people, you and me, would still be dead in our sins. What's it became? Let me try and make it. Let me try and prove it. It's going to take some explaining and it's going to be a little bit of a journey for the rest of this morning. It's going to be a winding story, and I love a winding story. Not everyone does. I like tangents. My wife likes living on the straight and narrow. So what I'm going to do is, this is a bit tangential, but I'm going to put some stakes in the ground that when you hear the the word that I'm about to give you, the words I'm going to give you, they're kind of stakes to know that we're still on the path that Matt hasn't gone kind of mental, okay? There's seven words, seven words beginning with S, these seven S's form kind of the backbone of the story. The, the kind of, the, they provide the kind of the, the straight and narrow that I'm going to stay on. So when you hear these seven, I'll allude to them. You'll know we're on the right track. This is the story explaining why Leviticus is so key for our salvation. It's a story, and like most stories, it's best to start like this. A long, long time ago, eons before Leviticus was recorded, On the first page of the Bible, in fact, Genesis 1, the universe was created and it was good. Not only good, but men and women were created. Adam and Eve is the pinnacle of creation. They were very good. And God planted them in a lavish garden 
to tend and care for this garden and to help this garden kind of spread throughout the world so that the whole world would be made like Eden, Edenized, paradiseized. This garden was first S coming up of us seven first S. This garden, though, was a sacred space. It was a sacred space because God lived there. I mean, God's omnipresent. He's kind of everywhere, but in a special way, he kind of presence, concentrated himself there. In fact, we learn in chapter 3, verse 8 of Genesis, chapter 3, the big number, 8, the small, um, big, small number, 3, 8, it says this, Then the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And wherever God is, that is a sacred space. But in that self-same chapter, Genesis chapter 3, our parents rebelled, sinning, second S, sinning against God, believing the lies of that satanic serpent, third S, it's a double S there, satanic serpent, believing the lies of Satan rather than the truth, Satan, rather than the truth of God. And you'll probably be familiar with the scene, even if you're not a Christian, Adam and Eve tempted to eat tree from the forbidden knowledge of good and evil, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, desiring a knowledge of good and evil, a knowledge that at least for a time had been off limits to them. They, like billions of humanoids after them, not trusting God and his word and his timing, thinking they knew better than God. God's response was immediate, a curse upon the man, a curse upon the woman, a curse upon the serpent, and a curse upon the earth, Genesis chapter 3. A curse which explains so much of our world's suffering, our grief, our frustration, our feeling that the world is not right, that there's kind of sand in the gears of life, as Paul says in Romans 8, reflecting on the scene. Our creation at that point was subjected, made subject to frustration. And the pinnacle of that frustration is, of course, death. Death enters the world because of sin. But wherever there is God's judgment, there is also God's mercy. And within that curse, there is a seed of hope. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity, this is God speaking to the serpent, which we find out later as Satan, if we didn't know already. I will put enmity, that's hostility, between you, the serpent and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He, that's Eve's offspring, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now the word for offspring here is literally seed. That's our fourth S, if you're following along at home. Fourth S, seed. God promises that the seed of Eve, her eventual offspring, will crush the head of Satan. So kind of a inside that curse, kind of an Easter egg of a promise, of a hope, but there's also a kindness to God straight after. Have a look at chapter 3, verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Now, this isn't God just merely providing a fashion accessory. In fact, it's more than God providing warmth for Adam and Eve. This is providing them with protection. But, this is the bit that we often miss, not just protection against the elements, protection against God himself. This is 5th S. This is the very first sacrifice of the Bible. God knows, as he stands before Adam and Eve, that they are now infected with sin. Tongues, tonsils, orifices, organs, blood, bones blighted by evil and corruption. Not just them, but now the universe breathed into existence by the life of God now choking with death, its putrid, fetid stench inhaled and expired by all. And with sin in it, flesh and bone can no longer survive in the presence of God. 
To a holy God, sin is like kerosene to an open flame. And so God lovingly provides a sacrifice. The animal's death in Adam and Eve's place suffering the death they should have died so that they can be before him. You could think of it like this, sixth S coming up. The blood of the animals forms a shield, sixth S, against God's holiness. But it's only a short-lived solution, a temporary shield. Because God's judgment, God's holiness will fry them. And so Adam and Eve, we may well know this bit of the story, and then us with them, humanity with them, are cast out of the garden, out of the presence of God, significantly for their own safety. Uh, Not only that, but you may well know that the cherubim, don't think cute little angels at, at Valentine's Day, but fiery death angels wielding swords are there to prevent the return to the garden. Chapter 3, verse 24. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Men and women can no longer return to their Edenic life with God. And God himself, mind, once who walked the earth in the cool of the day, disappears for a very, very long time. As you read Genesis, you do see him. He appears at the flood, at the Tower of Babel, kind of obscurely, fleetingly, and it seems to be only ever to kind of judge. And it's like that for millennia. The absence feels eternal, but then God appears to a man. Genesis 12, the man's name is Abraham. He's a wandering Aramean. God calls this man from obscurity, into relationship. He lavishes blessing, covenant promises on him. He promises this ancient nonagenarian, it's a classy way of saying 90-year-old, promises him a land and many seed, many offspring. In fact, he promises this 90-year-old without any kids at this point, as many descendants as there are stars in the sky, sand on the beach, a seed through whom the world will be blessed. And Abraham Abraham laughs and his wife Sarah scoffs, but sure enough, a son is born. A people is formed and they flourish for the next 500 years. God blessing, guiding these people from a distance, seen in shadows and glimpses of him, opaquely, but he's there. And then God's people, Israel as they're known, grow, multiply, and become enslaved as foreigners in Egypt, a distant land of hostile gods. And then another half a millennia, 500 years passes. Then out of nowhere it feels in 1500 BC or thereabouts, God not only delivers his people, his seed from the clutches of Pharaoh, through mighty signs and wonders, not only does he that, not only does he promise them a new land, or really Abraham's land, to be fair, a land flowing of milk, with milk and honey, but then in the second book of the Bible, about a hundred or so pages in, Exodus chapter 40, in fact, 26 actually kind of prefigures this, God announces his coming to the earth to live with Abraham's seed, Israel. God's people. God absent, now present. God transcendent, now imminent. God infinite, now intimate. And this is absolutely the best and the worst news possible for any human being. Because in Exodus 40, Yahweh, that's his special name, the creator of the Most High, comes all the way down to live in a new sacred space. That was our first S. In a tabernacle, which Beck read to us. Think of it, if you, if you kind of wouldn't work it out, couldn't work it out, it's a portable temple tent. Comes to live in a tabernacle, but among, in the middle, 
of Israel's camp, in the middle of his people. The glory of the Lord fills the sacred space in the heart of their living quarters. Yes, it's true that he he lives in a sealed section, in the Holy of Holies, a place that only one man once a year can enter into, a place guarded like Eden with cherubim. Pictures of those dread angels are woven into the, the, the fabric of this tent. But he is there, not in heaven, not on a mountain, just him and Moses, but he lives in the camp of Israel. There are nearly two million people there. And every single one of them is about to die instantly. Singed to a crisp. Sin cannot survive the dread holiness of the triune God. See, God's presence is a blessing, of course, but it's also to an unholy humanity the curse of death. God's people are about to be fried, a seed popped like corn in the microwave of God's wrath. And that seed long ago prophesied that would crush Satan's head. He and his bloodline would be cut off, the hope gone. All hope would be lost. But God acts immediately, and he saves our seventh S, our final S, he saves. And he saves them by speaking to Moses and by giving him, telling him Leviticus. See, God Almighty loves his people enough to draw himself down from on high to live with them, to draw near to them, but he also, out of his sheer abundant love, also provides a way that they can draw near to him without being toast. Yahweh God, the Father, the protector of Israel. And so so what does he do? Well, he quickly provides for them hundreds of defenses and shields, our fourth or fifth S there, and escape hatches, so they would not be instantly fried by the loveliness of his holiness. If you're kind of a Harry Potter fan, think of it, it's a bit like defense against the dark arts. But the image is inverted It's defending Israel because of their dark hearts against the radiant light of God's holiness. And in this book, he describes hundreds, if not thousands of ways to wash away sin, burn away sin, carry away sin, tip out sin, scrape off sin, cut off skin, push out sin, insulate against sin, speak against sin, and most relentlessly on page after page after page, a way to drown sin in the blood of another. Israel shielding themselves in the skin of a sacrifice. Their blood doomed, the blood bought by the death of another. In fact, as you read uh, Leviticus, one thing we're going to look at in two weeks' time, and it's going to be a really academic start to our next sermon, just as a heads up. We're going to look at really how unhelpful a bunch of the translations that we work with in Leviticus. It kind of sucks the life out of it like a leech. And one of those really unhelpful translations is our word offering. The word in Leviticus literally is near bringing or bringing near. And so Leviticus is all about offerings. It's all about ways that Israel can draw near to their God. In fact, in Leviticus, God is so close to Israel that he's kind of a micron away from being too close. In fact, he gets up so close to Moses and speaks more directly and plainly and intimately with him than any other Bible character. until 1,400 or so years later, where, to use the first chapter of John's Gospel's language, God literally tabernacles, God tents with us in human flesh. Jesus comes born as a man. So let me make my point again. Without Leviticus, we are not saved Without Leviticus, Christians are in peril. Not, to be clear, because this is liable for misunderstanding, not because the sacrifices of Leviticus saved. No, they couldn't. The Bible is clear. The endless bloodbath that was that system of sacrifice could, at best, 
temporarily take away sin and guilt. Never permanently, never truly and deeply. Leviticus saves because it points us to Christ. And you see this as we're going through Hebrews for a reason in our Bible studies. Jesus is the true Leviticus. He's the priest, the temple, the sacrifice, the throne, the mercy seat, the tribute offering, the food offering, the drink offering, the incense, the dwelling. He is the grace of God. And you see, without Leviticus, Christ's death, well, it kind of gets all its meanings and categories in a significant sense from Leviticus. His death being about a penalty, penal, substitutionary, atoning, ransoming, redeeming, justifying, purifying, forgiving, covenantally confirming. All these categories come from Leviticus. As my friend put it, Leviticus is the whole play fully rehearsed and performed, displayed before men and angels. He goes on to say, Leviticus is the very foundation, the scaffolding, the framework, the blueprint, or the tapestry design for the proper understanding of what Christ has accomplished in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. So it saves because it points us to Christ, but it also saves because it preserves the bloodline, the seed line of the Messiah. You see, without Leviticus, without that temple structure, the tabernacle structure and the sacrifices, the people of Israel, God's seed, would have become a pile of ash and dirt. And the Messiah, Jesus, who would come, the promised seed who crushes Satan's head, he would never have come about. You could put it like this. For a thousand or so years, Leviticus kept humanity on life support incubating until that seed, Jesus, arrived. To bring it to a close, Leviticus might be the skeleton coast for many, but I contend this morning that our understanding of humanity's plight, our understanding of God's mercy, of our sin and Jesus' majesty, of our wretchedness and God's holiness, our understanding of all that will be paper-thin and skeletal without Leviticus. Here's my closing pitch for our series. My hope for this 10 or so weeks in Leviticus is that God would grow our love and our awe for him. My hope is that we're won over, maybe for the first time, maybe for the eighth time, maybe for the 800th time, won over to the greatest story of all. A story of sacred space, of serpents, of seeds, of shields, of sacrifices and salvation. A story that's all true as well. And that as we live and move and have our being in this story, as we see how it kind of connects with the rest of Scripture and perhaps might breathe fresh life into the pages of the Bible for us, that we'll see that this story monsters, destroys, annihilates all the other stories that our world live by. That we see that the story of Scripture is better than Disney, better than Marvel, better than BuzzFeed, better than celebrity culture, better than victim culture, better than wealth accumulation, than academic success. Better than our world's shallow promises of self-expression and sexual self-realization. It plays a better tune than what our world dances and listens along to. Ultimately, that we are wowed and amazed at the majesty, the wisdom, the power, the authority, and the overflowing and abounding grace and mercy of our God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for the book of Leviticus. We thank you for what it points to about who we are and who you are. And ultimately, we are so grateful for how it points and preserves, how it guides us to look and see at the wonder and the beauty of our Lord Jesus.
that from it we're given so many more angles so that like a diamond we might see the facets of Christ's death and resurrection for us. That you might use these 10 weeks to shape my heart, shape our hearts, so that we have the eyes to see the brilliance of this story. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one of the things that we're going to see, just to kind of uh, to steal some of my future thunder, one of the things we're going to see about the book of Leviticus is that it institutes a bunch of sacrifices, but most of the sacrifices, or over half, actually occur before Leviticus. But there's one sacrifice and there's one ritual that stands kind of apart from the others in its uniqueness, in the fact that it didn't exist before Leviticus. And that is the peace offering which was in fact, and we'll look at this in time, it was actually a sacrifice that you would then eat before God. It's kind of prefigured, if, if, if you're going to kind of correct me on this later on, if this is your thing, it's kind of prefigured when, when Moses and the 70 elders eat with God on the mountain of, in Mount Sinai in Exodus. But in a real sense, it's a new thing. It's kind of pointing towards us having a meal with God that ultimately looks forward to as we see in Revelation, the meal that we do have with our Lord at the end of time, the wedding supper of the Lamb. But it's one that we enjoy, kind of reenact, participate in kind of proleptically, looking forwardly uh, in the Lord's Supper, which we share together this morning. And as ever we drink and eat of our Lord Jesus Christ now, he is the substance, the price, the proof, the power, and the fullness of all we've heard, all we've sung, all we've prayed and declared. We are the body of Christ and his spirit is with us. And we partake of the meal according to the pattern of Matthew 26, 26 to 29. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. We are reminded that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Before we share in this meal, a reminder that we give to the people in our church and who are visiting each week uh, that this table, the Lord's Supper, is for people that are not righteous. It's for people that have acknowledged their unrighteousness and their need for the Lord Jesus' righteousness. An acknowledgement that's demonstrated in faith, in baptism, and almost always in church attendance, whether here or elsewhere. Which means that if you're a Christian here this morning, if you've been baptized, go to church elsewhere, then you're welcome to come down and eat the bread and drink the wine or juice that we have. This is, as I remind us every week, this is food for the fight. Uh, If you are still struggling with your sin, then this is sustenance and nourishment as you do that. But if you don't, if you no longer feel repentant for your sin, if you no longer want to return, or you've never been repentant before, then don't eat and drink this uh, because you'll be eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. But you are warmly welcome and we're so glad you're here at this church. And I'm actually going to lead you now in a prayer, lead us all in a prayer for those people that can't eat of the Lord's table this morning. So please join me. Father, I pray for those that don't yet believe. I pray for those who are stuck in their sin and are unrepentant, whose heart for a time has been hardened and turned away from you. I pray that by your grace you might send your spirit, that you might soften their hearts, that you might enlighten their eyes, so that the impenitent, the unrepentant, might find favor and grace and salvation in you, and that they might come to this table. In Jesus' name, amen. Our bread is gluten-free. Uh, we have wine and juice. When you come up, the wine's labelled, and the other side is, of course, the juice. Here are the words of our Lord Jesus as he speaks to us at this moment. 
Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm humble and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we do not presume to come to your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your many and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from your table, and yet you give us your body, which is real food, and your blood, which is real drink. In Jesus' name, amen. His body given for you, Jim, and his blood shed for you. Jesus' body given for us, take and eat in remembrance of him.
Jesus' blood shed for the forgiveness of sins, take and eat, take and drink in remembrance of him. Father in heaven, so bind us in life and death to Jesus' sacrifice that our lives, broken and offered with his, may proclaim his death and carry his resurrection into the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Stand and sing our final song together.
We have lunch together uh, just after the service out there in the courtyard. Um, it's a barbecue, a sausage sizzle. Uh, love for you to join us and let me leave you now with these words from Paul uh, in 1 Thessalonians 3. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen.